Thank you very much, uh, Alec, for that very appropriate welcome. Um, I keep waiting for the moonshot to take off on Manske and Kop down the road. But uh, thank you very much, and what a great honor it is to be invited to be the first speaker at the Biz News Conference this year. Um, I noticed that there are a number of politicians on your uh, agenda over the course of the next two days, and uh, it got me thinking because politicians aren't the most popular bunch of people at the best of times. And it reminded me of the story about how a group of scientists had suggested that instead of doing scientific experiments on rats, that they should rather do them on politicians. And their thinking went along the lines of, well, there's no shortage of politicians. And I think if you look at this year's uh, number of parties contesting, that can be borne out. Secondly, nobody really cares what happens to politicians. And thirdly, and most importantly, there's just some things they can't get the rats to do. <laughs> but it really is great to be here, Alec, and thank you for the invitation, and thank you for the work that you and the Biz News team do in keeping the conversation going in South Africa and helping to shape an informed public debate. And I think it's fair to say that all of us here over the next two days are here for precisely the same reason, because we're interested in an informed debate about the future of South Africa. And over the coming two days, there will no doubt be no shortage of debate, just as it should be in a vibrant democracy like our own. You'll hear the opinions of different business leaders, of politicians and analysts who will share sometimes very, very different views on what's going on and what is likely to happen. But I would submit that the trick to making these conversations that we have over the coming days truly fruitful that we must ensure that it is all times an informed debate. As the saying goes, we're all entitled to our own facts, our own opinions, but we're not entitled to our own facts. So I'd like to kick things off this morning by making a first submission to the Biz News 2024 public debate by setting out a number of data points and then by sharing my view of what this information is telling us. And of course, I do so in the context, Alex, that in 80 days, we will be facing the most important election in post-democratic South Africa. So today's meeting, I think, is especially well-timed because it, it is taking place here in Amanus just two days after the release of the first major poll conducted since the election has been announced and in the heat of the 2024 election campaign. And importantly, this poll released by Brenthurst Foundation is the first public poll that we've seen in South Africa released after the announcement of the formation of the Mkonto Wesizwe party with its fieldwork that was done just two weeks ago. So it gives us a up-to-date insight into the current state of politics and forms a great basis for informed debate over the next two days. So let's start when, with the national picture. The Brenthurst poll now puts the ANC at just 39% nationally, a decline of 18 percentage points since the 2019 election. Puts the DA up to 27% from 20% in 2019. The Mkonto Esizwe party is at 13%, just three months after it was endorsed by former President Jacob Zuma, while the EFF is stagnant at around 10 and 11%. At a provincial level, the story is slightly different. While it has the DA retaining its outright majority in the Western Cape, uh, in Gauteng it is up, the DA is up, and is set to grow from 14 to 19 percent in KwaZulu Natal. And this is while the ANC has declined to around 34 percent in Gauteng and to just 20 percent in KwaZulu Natal, with MK shockingly at 25 percent in KwaZulu Natal. To say that this paints a remarkable picture and somewhat terrifying, I think is an understatement because it's nothing less than a political earthquake in the political landscape in South Africa. Firstly, it is very clear that the MK party is now decimating the African National Congress in my home province of KwaZulu-Natal. Secondly, the DA has increased its share since last year. And this is now reinforced by the fact that according to the poll, the DA is the most favorably regarded party in South Africa, with the net favorability score 
having increased a full 15 points over the last 15 months. The combination of these two trends, the decimation of part of the ANC's core electorate by the Mkunto Asizwe, combined with the growth of the DA among centrist voters from different backgrounds, has made previously unthinkable scenarios now within the bounds of reach and possibility. For example, if we can get all of our voters out on election day, the DA is in striking distance now of being the single largest party in Gauteng. And that should come as, as some hopeful comfort to those who have come to the Western Cape and realized that water does actually come out of the taps when you turn them on. In KwaZulu-Natal, the combined support of the DA, the IFP, and our other partners means that the multi-party charter for South Africa is by far now the largest single voting bloc in that province. At a national level, the multi-party charter is just 6% behind the African National Congress, a fact that should spur us all in the multi-party charter to work even harder to get out our voters on election day and get this MPC collective over the line on the 29th of May. And on that note, I want to pause to, spend, to send a special word of recognition to one of our valued MPC partners. On Sunday, the Encarta Freedom Party delivered a magnificent manifesto launch at the packed Moses Mabida Stadium in the Durban heat. And I'm convinced that this has helped to boost the IFP's uh, reach in KwaZulu-Natal and will also assist the multi-party charter. So I want to extend from this platform my warmest congratulations to Mr. V.F. Schlabisa for that excellent manifesto launch. And I think he deserves a round of applause. I think it's also a testament to the maturity of the multi-party charter that instead of fighting amongst each other as opposition parties, we are now in a position to share in each other's successes where those successes we know are going to lead to a better outcome for the future of our country and for the people who we serve. So even as the individual parties within the multi-party charter retain their individual identities and campaign on their manifestos, the multi-party charter has now made it possible for the first time in 30 years for parties to share similar foundational values and principles to build each other up rather than spend an election breaking each other down. And that's what I submit our country wants to see. It doesn't want to see like-minded opposition parties squabble among, amongst each other for an ever-decreasing share of votes. They want to see us going boldly out there to capture new votes and to make the whole greater than the sum of the parts. But however encouraging those results are, not everything is moonlight and roses. Because alongside the enormous opportunities that have been created by the decline of the ANC and the rise of the DA and alongside our other partners in the multi-party charter, there are some very real threats appearing on our horizon. Back in April last year from the floor of the Federal Congress, I spoke following my re-election as the leader of my party to outline a vision for change. In addition to announcing what was then called the Moonshot Pact, but which has now moved into becoming the multi-party charter, I also issued a very stern warning of a risk that was facing South Africa's future that is now becoming more palpable every single day. And I actually went back to my speech in preparation for this one, and I want to quote again from it now, and I quote, given the fact that the ANC now officially co-governs with the EFF, in parts of Gauteng, we need to start taking the threat of these parties ganging up to destroy our country in 2024 very, very seriously." Unquote. And I want to be unequivocal about the DA's view on this. The day that an ANC EFF government takes over in South Africa, it will be doomsday for our country. There will be overnight disinvestment. There will be a writing off of our country on international markets, 
and there will be radical consequences for South Africa's lurch to the rest, to the left. And this doomsday will make what happened in Zimbabwe look like a dress rehearsal and will leave all South Africans, black, white, Indian, colored, destitute and abandoned. And that is why during the remaining weeks before next year's election, before this, ele before this next election, the DA is going to make it our number one priority and to do everything absolutely in our power to prevent a doomsday coalition from taking place. Since I've uttered those words in April last year, the doomsday coalition has now garnered a powerful new prospective partner. In addition to the ANC, the EFF, and their proxies like the PA, Good, and Al Jamar that prop them up in government, the rise of Zuma's MK party has potentially strengthened the hand of the doomsday radicals. If the RET faction of the ANC, the EFF, MK, and those little proxy parties find a way to come together after this election, South Africa will face an existential crisis requiring the strongest opposition that has ever been seen. And if we want to understand what that looks like in practice, we saw an example of it in Bloemfontein last week. As the ANC and the Free State has realized that their majority is now under threat, it started to turn to populism and anarchy in that province. At the alleged instigation of the ANC, thousands of people descended on Luria Park outside Bloemfontein last week in the biggest coordinated land grab that we've seen in many years. And after the municipality initially turned a blind eye to this land invasion, we were forced to go to court to force it to take action. We succeeded this time around. But I shudder to think what will happen if an ANC, MK, EFF national government starts encouraging these Zimbabwe-style land grabs in cities, towns, and farms across the country. Can you imagine how investor markets would react to national and provincial governments led by the likes of Malema, Zuma, and Mashatile? In fact, if this doomsday scenario comes to pass, there's every reason to be concerned that the 2024 election could be the last free and fair election that we have in South Africa. When we look at the good and the bad side by side, it's very clear that a binary has now emerged for this election. On the one hand, you have the multi-party charter with a vision for, and I quote, a new government to build a just, inclusive, and prosperous South Africa based on opportunity, freedom, and security for all of its citizens. On the other hand, is the Doomsday Coalition composed of state capture rogues, VBS looters, RET factionless, and the most wanted from the Zondo Commission. It is in this binary that is shaping not only this election campaign, but I would advance shaping the future of South Africa. The side that wins nationally and print provinces like Gauteng and KwaZulu-Natal will determine whether our country embarks upon a fundamentally better path or whether it accelerates down the road to ruin. In this binary environment, we've also started to see the emergence of spoiler parties that seek to exploit the coalition environment for narrow personal gain. Political opportunists who are not only willing to sell themselves to the highest bidder, but who are more than happy to actively undermine the rational opposition. To these mercenaries and opportunists, they live by the maxim of, these are my principles. If you don't like them, I have others. And this is a dangerous, dangerous political posture to adopt in this emerging binary political environment that we face in South Africa. Let's take this province of the Western Cape by way of example. While the Brenthurst Foundation confirms that the vast majority of voters recognize that the Western Cape is the best run province in South Africa, with the DA on track to retain a majority, 
It does not dissuade the opportunists from fighting the DA instead of fighting the ANC. It must be really short-sighted to make your goal to break the only province in the country that's not in ANC control and to remove the DA's majority in this, in this particular province. Instead of working to persuade voters in the eight other provinces about why we need to liberate them from the clutches of corruption, maladministration, and poor governance that has become to typify uh, their position, some of these players are starting to position themselves as the opposition to the opposition. And some of this is not new. We already saw how in 2019, Good um, and the PA and others uh, aligned with the, with the ANC. But more recently, parties that I would have thought should have been part of the multi-party charter and should be far more rational actors have openly declared their opposition to the DA and that they announced that their work and mission is to remove the DA from power in places like the Western Cape, where afterwards they intend to pursue land expropriation. If you don't believe me, just look at Razum Zanti's policy platform, where they've been unequivocal about their support for land expropriation and doubled down on it in a piece that was written in the Daily Maverick yesterday, where they said that those people who stand up for property rights, for individual ownership of land in the country, are shrill. Well, let me be very clear today. If standing up for property rights, the bedrock of any successful democracy is shrill, well, then I'm happy to be deemed as shrill, and I would hope that people in this room would be happy to do so as well. But the only thing standing in their way is the DA majority here in the Western Cape. And if somebody wants to see the consequences of what happens when you become an opposition to the opposition and you, and you break ranks and, and break good governance and make common cause with the corrupt, with the maladministrators, with the crooks and the cadres, the consequences on full display just up the road here in NASDAQ, where an ANC EFF PA coalition collapsed the municipality within months. Unlike Oberstrand, rubbish has piled up through that once picturesque town. In another instance, a dead body floated for two weeks in the town's reservoir for drinking water. The body was so decomposed when they pulled it out of that reservoir that the arm broke off as they were getting it out of that reservoir. Make no mistake about it. This track record is repeated time and time again, whether it's in Beaufort West or whether it is now in Bitu just down the road. It's simple, really. Anyone who plays with fire by voting for opportunists, instead of safeguarding good governance and majorities, needs to look to Nisner and other places to understand the consequences. Be careful of what you wish for, as the saying goes. It's Nasna today, tomorrow it will be the whole Western Cape. So instead of helping the ANC while treating the DA as the enemy, I think it would be in the best interest to encourage people to be supporting the opposition cause to keep the EFF and the ANC out of the levers of power. And we've seen this type of cooperation existing in KwaZulu-Natal, where in partnership with Mr. Schlebis's IFP, we've entered into a situation where if they've got a better chance of winning an award, we stand back and vice versa. And as a result of that mature politics, focusing on who the real enemy is, not on trying to be in opposition to the opposition, we've been able to take seats off the ANC and to keep the EFF out. That's how pragmatic, mature politics works. And it's a tragedy that we're not seeing the similar maturity in other quarters. I wish to conclude today by setting out how the DA sees its role in the landscape, and I'm mindful of the fact that I'm eating into some of my question time. First of all, we feel a profound sense of responsibility to the Western Cape. Here, our mission is to protect our gains, to take more control of key functions through our powers bill, and by driving devolution harder than ever before so that we can fill the gap left by the incapable national state and take control of key levers of the economy that have currently been denied to us. 
In the Western Cape, we've got a lot to show. We've still got a lot to do. We're not perfect and we don't get it right all the time. But we have also a lot to lose if we lose our majority here. Secondly, we want to work with our partners at a provincial level to expand the number of provinces that are held in opposition control. That's why KwaZulu-Natal and Gauteng are going to be so fundamentally important to whether we can rescue the country. And thirdly and finally, at a national level, our mission is to become a big, strong party at the heart of a new multi-party national government. We've learned from painful experience that not all coalitions work well, and when you have over-fragmentation of the vote, it leads to situations like you see in Johannesburg and some of the other metros. And we believe that by having strong, stable partners at the heart of a multi-party charter, we will be able to ensure that we are able to deliver a government that can last the five-year term and focus like a laser beam on service delivery. We believe that we are equipped to do that. We launched our manifesto uh, two weeks back in uh, Pretoria, outside the Union buildings, and it focuses like a laser beam on just seven achievable things that we think need to be done over the next five years. Creating two million new jobs, ending load shedding and water shedding, halving the rate of violent crime, including murder, attempted murder, and gender-based violence, abolishing cater deployment in favor of a merit-based public service, lifting six million people out of poverty, tripling the number of grade four learners who can read for meaning, and ensuring quality health care for all, irrespective of economic status. Now, of course, in the long term, in the long run, the laundry list of what you want to achieve is so much longer than that. And there are many things more than that that we want to achieve. But if we believe that if you don't get these seven things right in the next five years, it makes achieving any of the other things that you want to achieve impossible. So, in times of crisis, you must prioritize. And that's exactly what you will find in the DA's manifesto, our rescue plan for South Africa. We've got the plan, we've got the people, and we've got the on-the-ground experience that it will take to ensure that there's a strong anchor of South Africa's first multi-party national government. And in this election, the stakes are too high to stay at home. On the 29th of May, South Africa will either emerge into a dreadful reality controlled by Julius Malema, Jacob Zuma, and others, or it will embark down a new path empowered by the multi-party charter. In this election, I believe a vote for the DA is win, win, win. It's a vote for the DA is a vote against the ANC, EFF, MK, Doomsday Coalition, a vote for the DA is to keep the ANC and the EFF out of the most successful province in the country, the Western Cape. And a vote for the DA is a vote for a new multi-party charter government with strong partners that have a credible plan to know how to get things done. And so my call and to the people in this hall and to across South Africa is that on the 29th of May, vote soberly, and vote like your life depends on it. Because in this election, it really does. Thank you, Alec.